we call the, the theme for this event Cyber Offense Redefined. Um, Rob just mentioned one aspect of cyber offense which should be used sparingly. Uh, one of the things that we wanted to accomplish today is to maybe broaden the scope of what cyber offense means uh, and talk about the other ways in which you can be offensive uh, without um, executing on some of the things that Rob was just mentioning. So um, the, the one important piece of this, which I think we're going to start hearing a lot more discussion on over the next several years, is automation and orchestration. So I'm pleased to have Mr. Paul Beckman, the deputy CISO for DHS, with me to have a conversation about what they're doing over at DHS. So Paul, it's good to have you here. Thank you very much. Um, uh, Dr. Ray Latier um, had to brief uh, the number two at Marine Corps this morning, so he will actually be coming in at lunch, and I'll be having a similar conversation with him. So this was designed to be a group chat. It'll just be kind of a convo between, between Paul and I. Um, so to kick off with, you know, Paul, we talked about this uh, this last week when we were getting ready for this. Um, we know that the resources are limited, um, both in terms of time and qualified uh, workers, uh, and that obviously puts a lot of constraints uh, on the organization and on the SOC, particularly in an environment where indicators of compromise are going through the roof um, and, and uh, there just needs to be more support. And so we've seen the introduction of new technologies and processes and tools which are um, enabling automation and orchestration. Now one of the things that we get frustrated with is how terms can be taken over by marketing folks and uh, basically um, I think devalued and we as a community become maybe desensitized to some of these concepts because all of a sudden in the last year everybody does machine learning, right, overnight. Um, and so I guess I wanted to start off with um, thinking about that context and thinking about this term artificial intelligence and machine learning. What does that mean for you, not from a marketing perspective, but as an executive in charge of security, you know, what do those concepts mean to you and what is the value that you think it provides you in, in, in supporting DHS? So at the very high level, um, I think the obvious thing that it means to me is becoming more effective and more efficient. Uh, one of the things that came out in the cyber EO was a charge to um, all uh, federal agencies to try and realize some efficiencies, become more efficient, become a more lean, um, effective machine. And that's what automation and um, orchestration, I think, means to me. Is the, is the, it provides the ability to become uh, much more leaner, much more efficient, much more uh, effective. Um, we've had these terms for, we've had automation for forever. I mean, automation is nothing new. Uh, you know, I often get the question, what's the difference between automation and orchestration? So, you know, I remember building macros 15 years ago to make my job at the time much more uh, automated, mm -hmm. so I could automate a lot of those, those tasks. When you're talking about orchestration, though, and that's, that's kind of the new piece to me, is the orchestration piece. So now I have all of these things providing these automated tasks, but they're still not perfect. You know, a lot of people think that AI and um, um, the machine learning will be able to yeah. take away my tier one sock, and to some degree it will. But it's not, it won't take away at all. We're still, I mean, I think today we're still about 70, 80%, 70% for artificial intelligence to become effective. It still can't identify a cat 30% um, uh, of the time when it's looking at these pictures. That's why you'll get those interesting CAPTCHAs where it's telling you to identify, you know, which picture has a cat, which picture has a street sign, mm -hmm. stuff like that. Because machines still aren't there yet in their ability to, to identify those. So I still need that human interaction to, to go in and, and do that that piece that only a human can do, and that's the orchestration piece. So I've got all of these uh, disparate tools kind of coming in and doing their automated piece, but I still need that 30% that human interaction to be able to do that, and that's the orchestration. That human is yeah. the one orchestrating all of those together to make it an effective and efficient tool. Interesting, and so you mentioned that the automation piece is not necessarily new, the orchestration is. Do you think there's, uh, uh, does the community understand the difference? Is there a need for more education and more more awareness around these things? I think it will become apparent, uh, no. I mean, I think it will just become apparent. I think it will become obvious to people. I was telling my wife last night, it's kind of funny, uh, she keeps me grounded to a large degree, and she's like, oh, what are you talking about tomorrow? And I, I was explaining to her the whole thing about automation and orchestration. She's like, what? I thought you guys were doing that 20 years ago. So she, <laughs> I'm, so she was just astounded that we hadn't figured this out yeah. yet, that we did have all of this technology out there, but we hadn't figured out this orchestration piece yet. Um, so yeah, it's just funny that yeah, yeah. It, it took us this long to get here and it's kind of, it really, I started scratching my head, you're like, it really is kind of surprising that yeah, it took us long yeah. to get that. Well that's why, again, why we do these things, I think that a lot of times uh, the vocabulary is out there but people need to, um, they just need to be, um, be re-educated, if you will, I think, some of these things. So, so that, on that point, do you have any examples of, of what's going on within your organization right now and some specific concrete, maybe case studies you can share with the audience about sure. how you're executing some yeah, of Yeah, absolutely. And just, I mean, everybody across DHS is, is seriously looking at automation and orchestration because uh, of the power that it provides. We've got one component that is actually farther ahead than, than most. They have implemented it. 
Um, and long story short, it looked, you know, after you take in the, the pilot, the licensing, the development costs, they spent about $1.5 million to implement this tool. And within the last six months, it's only been up for six months, in six months, they have identified uh, over $300,000 in savings so wow. on a return on investment. And how they got that, it's, I mean, that's one of the beautiful things about this tool is it, it, it is unique in the respect that it is so easy to figure out your return on investment, the, the savings that you're getting. If you start doing activity-based costing and breaking out these repeatable processes step by step, you know, for every, every time I get a PII spill, here's all the steps a person would have to take to be able to remediate that PII spill. Once you have all the tasks, you figure out how long it takes to do that task, you, you average in the, the, the average hourly rate that it would take somebody to do that, and you can clearly identify every time I automate that process, here's exactly how much I'm going to be saving in, in, in human interaction or human hours. Um, and, just, and they've only reached the tip of the iceberg, in my opinion, with, with respect to what they've been able to automate. But with the very little that they have been automating, Six months, three hundred thousand dollars, and that you know again, that's just the beginning. Yeah. This thing is going to pay for itself um, virtually in just a very, very short, yeah. very short amount of time. So, so on that note, one of the challenges you always hear people say is, "I don't have. I need to get executive buy-in. I don't have the the resources. I, I, I have a certain pool of funds, and I have to use them for X, Y, Z. You know, sometimes compliance-related issues. Did you guys do, do a cost-benefit analysis beforehand to justify the investment in these types of things? Yes. Or how were you able to get the buy-in from some of the folks Rob was mentioning that needs to be, need to be stakeholders in the process? We did a cost-benefit analysis through that activity-based costing model. We were able to show, hypothetically, how much we would be able to save um, in the long term. So again, just a very easy tool and solution to be able to do that cost-benefit analysis on. Mm -hmm. As soon as you can start quantifying, here's how many human hours I will no longer need to do this particular task, it becomes very easy to quantify. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, one of the things we also talked about was, and Rob mentioned this morning, is uh, opportunities to collaborate, right, between public-private sector organizations and, 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 in your case, possibly between uh, federal agencies. What are some of the opportunities that you see out there that, um, I think, maybe two-part question. One is, what are we doing a good job at, and what are some, what are some areas we could maybe um, focus more on to, to, to increase that collaborative So we're doing, we're doing a lot of collaboration now, certainly a lot more opportunities in the future to do that. Um, you know, with the Marine Corps in particular, um, we're leveraging their uh, cyber range capability, so there's a lot of collaboration there. I'm very, very thankful to the Marine Corps for enabling that for us. Um, CDM is a huge uh, opportunity for us to collaborate. Um, how we architect the dashboards with an archer, um, how we uh, set up these indicators of compromise. So there's a lot of um, collaboration going on with the CDM. I think there are the opportunities to collaborate, especially when you're talking about orchestration um, and automation, is going to be, it's going to be massive. The beautiful thing about these open source tools and these open architectures is that you can, you know, this whole idea of build it once, let be it leveraged by many. Um, what our components are doing now is as they build these, um, these APIs, as they build these hooks, as they build these processes and automate them, they're essentially uploading it in, into our version of GitHub so that any component who comes after them and sets up a similar architecture can just simply go up into this repository and pull down all of the work that had already been done. Um, so that is going to be a massive, um, a massive collaborative uh, initiative there. It's just being able to, you know, all of these smart people building all of these great things are going to be able to be leveraged by everybody who follows yeah. them. Yeah. And do, do you see that happening with the private sector, you know, critical infrastructure sectors like healthcare, finance, energy, working with, with you all, or is it right now more focused uh, government to government? Right now, focused government to government. Uh, I certainly expect it to become, you know, much more collaborative with the private industry. Yeah, that's great. We, uh, we had a similar talk at an event that we did, CyberConnect uh, in New York, and we had the CISO from Aetna talking about, either Aetna or US Bank, um, talking about the work that they're doing in orchestration and they're expressing interest in kind of collaborating with the government. So I think the, the interest is there and people just need to find conduits to, to come together. Absolutely, it just makes sense. I mean, again, this is all reusable code uh, that can be leveraged by anybody. It doesn't have to be federal or, or, yeah. or private. Yeah. It should be shared. So one of the, um, another big challenge that we know organizations exist uh, um, especially in, in balancing the acquisition process is Moore's Law, right? So how, what are you doing? I think you kind of alluded to this in your previous question, but what do you do to ensure that an investment that you make today, especially in the, with the federal acquisition process, that in two or three years when you actually have the tool, it's not already outdated, especially when it comes to uh, the security, security side? So a couple of thoughts uh, on that. Uh, specifically with respect to acquisition, I'm actually giving a, a talk uh, later on in the week uh, with respect to how we do rapid acquisitions to support cyber. Acquisition needs to become agile to some degree, and I know that that's kind of a loaded term when you're talking about software development, but it does. Um, 
The idea that the whole premise on Agile, as you all know, is that um, all requirements cannot be known. One of, the, one of the foundations of Agile is not all requirements can be known up front. Uh, so you need to build in a process to be able to accommodate these rolling requirements as they come in. Acquisition is going to be the same way. I don't know what my security requirements are going to be in four to five yeah. years. So I need to be able to build um, contracts to some degree that have the flexibility to be that agile so I can buy what I need, when I need it, where I need it. Yeah. So that's acquisitions. Now, with respect to, and so, so being agile in just the capabilities, the beautiful thing about the automation uh, piece of it, uh, or the orchestration piece of it, is that you can, if you build these open architectures with these APIs, as long as the solutions that come out have those open architectures and have the ability for me to create an API where I can just hook into them, then I'm not so worried about what the tools are going to be. Uh, I just know that I will be able to hook into it um, when the time comes. And on the, on, going back to the acquisition piece, are you having um, you know, contracts and SLAs obviously get in the way um, to some of the agility you're talking about, and sometimes vendors may have um, a preference one or the other. Are you finding in setting up contracts to give you the agility and flexibility you need, are you having um, getting resistance from the community, or is it a I wouldn't say process? resistance. It's more of an education to the acquisition folks. They're not, they don't typically have a you know, cyber security subject matter expert embedded with them, and that's one of the suggestions that we do is put these cyber security experts within the acquisition office uh, so that when they're reviewing my requirements and they're looking at what I'm looking for and what I needed to be able to do, they can kind of get it without having to come back to me every single time. Well, you know, do you want it to do this? Do you want it to do that? Yeah, interesting. And that, that's how you, you guys run it at DHS? Do you have a, a cyber person? No, but that, that's something that we are just now proposing on how we change and make it more efficient. Interesting, interesting. Um, the uh, the um, leveraging uh, SecDevOps, you kind of talked about the, the dev process to uh, speed up the release of compliance software. Um, how is that kind of, um, how do you guys leverage that uh, and, and how does that increase your ability to uh, take advantage of kind of the orchestration automation capabilities? So I'm very happy to hear that it's called Sec DevOps now. For the <laughs> longest time, Sec was out of that yes. word and it was just DevOps. Um, so it's, it's very encouraging to, you know, to hear people start re referencing that because it's always been that. You can't mm -hmm. have DevOps without doing it securely. Right. And for the longest time, you know, I thought Agile was, you know, Agile was difficult because, you know, again, the premise, I don't understand all the requirements. Security, I, I can tell you all of the requirements day one, what this system needs to be able to do from a security perspective, what the software, how the software needs to behave from a security perspective. So, it, you know, it just, I, I had no problem with Agile because uh, I knew all my requirements. So we are leveraging it. Uh, we are starting to leverage it very effectively, but um, it took us a while to really sit down and figure out how to effectively, you know, how do you move something from development uh, into testing and then into, yeah. into production securely? How do you, where do you want these gateways? What do you need to do with these gateways to do that? Um, so we're finally at a place that I think we are doing it extremely efficiently and securely. And the, the, one of the last questions here is about the, the human element to this, right? The human, again, Rob mentioned this a little bit, the uh, culture and people are sometimes one of the biggest obstacles, right? Aside from money or, um, or, or, or human capital resources, sometimes it just comes down to the changing the culture. Um, what are you finding? It sounds like you're doing some things with respect to staffing acquisition differently, with respect to educating and, and building you know, case studies beforehand. But how, how is DHS, um, what is DHS experiencing when it comes to the human element uh, as a barrier? And then how are you guys overcoming that? Ah, the human element, my favorite element of it all. <laughs> Um, so, bringing it back to automation and orchestration, one of the things that I found uh, in my SOC was that a lot of these analysts tend to gravitate towards certain types of security incidents they enjoy working with, and they kind of not necessarily ignore, but it deprioritize some of the other alerts that maybe not be so that might not be so sexy or may not be so fun. I had one SOC analyst. I was looking over his reports week after week, and this guy was infatuated with misuse, unauthorized software. He was trying to find people with unauthorized software, going to bad uh, websites. All of his incidents <laughs> had to do with misuse. And I'm like, you know, is it just that much misuse or are you just zeroing yeah. in laser-like focus on misuse? And it turned out that, yeah, he was kind of doing a laser-like focus on the misuse <laughs> and kind of, again, not, not ignoring, but deprioritizing right. the other alerts that he would get on his, on his shift. So, so that's kind of the human obstacle that I'm, that, I'm, that I'm facing, is how do I get them to focus on all the alerts? I mean, it's every single alert, while it may be a false positive, it, it, needs, to, it, yeah. it needs to be looked at. It, needs yeah. to, I mean, it just takes one of those alerts to be, any one of those alerts could be my next breach. Yeah. 
Um, so I need them to look at everything that I need them looking at, not just focusing in on their favorites. Um, and that's the beauty of the automation and orchestration piece. I can kind of take a lot of these non-sexy incidences out uh, of the equation and have it done automatically to where I can have my my teams focus on what I really want them to focus yeah. on, which is obviously you know, the APT-like threats. The beautiful thing about the automation and orchestration is when you look at it, 90, I, I'm guesstimating 90% of our incidences uh, are repeatable processes uh, that can be identified and set up to be done in an automated way. And if once we get to that utopia, once 90% of that generally is being handled uh, in an automated fashion, then I can really use the vast majority of my workforce to focus on what I really need yeah. them to do, which is the 10% the, the really bad guys. Yeah. So um, uh, with respect to um, kind of some parting thoughts for the folks in the room, if they're um, intrigued by this and understand the value prop and they're trying to identify how to introduce it uh, into their organization and how to prioritize, what, what, you know, where does someone get started? Is, is there um, um, a process that you can point them to or some best practices you can share? Um, certainly the best practices, I'm not sure if there's, you know, again, I would go back to the activity-based costing. Activity-based costing is a very simple uh, method by which you, you cost something out. Again, you identify all the steps required to do that activity guesstimate on how long it would take an average person to perform that activity, and then you just throw in the average hourly rate it would take somebody of that caliber to yeah. do those activities. And once you do that, it's very easy, again, to quantify in, in money how long it takes or you know, what the cost of that activity is. And once you start identifying these repeatable activities across your SOC infrastructure or any infrastructure for that matter, um, it becomes extreme. This is one of the easiest solutions I had where I was able to leverage this activity-based costing yeah. model. Um, so yeah, it just becomes almost obvious uh, and very evident and very easy to do to be able to quantify the savings that you would be able to achieve with some, some of these solutions. Yeah, and we talk about knowing your audience and how to communicate, and, and, and that's you know, putting dollars behind these, these asks is probably the best way to talk to the mm -hmm. nine IT community. I agree. Yeah, excellent. Uh, well, Paul, I really enjoyed the conversation. Thanks for sharing that, and we look forward to having you back uh, I was happy to time. do it. Thank awesome. you very much. Thank you.